This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by GoToAssist. Uh, so John, what is the latest with Shodan? And actually before that even, for our, our new viewers that are not, you know, that have been living under a rock, what is Shodan? All right, so Shodan is a search engine, but unlike Google, with Shodan you can find devices. So let's say you want to find, you know, an IIS 6.0 web server, you know, running, you know, Windows XP or something, I don't know. You want to find an operating system, you want to find a device, you want to find a router, printer, anything that you see around the house, webcam, you can use Shodan to find that. And so how does Shodan know where everything is on the internet? So the way it works is I just basically port scan the internet randomly. So you, you, one day you woke up and you're like, you know, I think I'm going to port scan the internet today. And then you just fired up Nmap and then went to sleep for, what, three months? Uh, it was a bit more than that. And I actually did that. that started because I wanted to write a port scanner. So I love programming. And I was like, well, I love Nmap, but I wanted to figure out how it works myself. So I wrote a basic SYN scanner. And I just started randomly picking IPs and checking them. And it was very slow at the beginning. I only grabbed, you know, like a few 10 results per second or something. But uh, yeah, I, I immediately realized that I expected more Apache web servers, more like Nginx and like popular, where you kind of deploy yourself. But there are a ton of routers, ton of embedded devices, like Cisco switches, like with, you know, full root access, public, everything like that. So very quickly, it kind of became apparent that this is not what I expected to see. And especially as I've been adding like other services like Memcache or Redis and stuff like that, or like Mongo recently, it's like, whoa, this is not what I think should be happening. And I'm just surprised by the just systematic issues that are actually out there on the internet and that people are, well, at least for a long time weren't aware of until Shodan made it easy to find. And so how did you make it easy to find? Because basically, like, this is like, this, I love this because, you know, when I was a little kid, I would go do what's called war dialing, where you just, you ever do that where you dial every number in the phone book to see if there's a modem on the other end? And you're doing this with, please tell me you're not doing 65,536 port numbers. No, 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 I don't do everything. So I, I, I scan the whole internet, but I only check for me like a few dozen ports. So I check all the popular, like FTP, SSH, SNMP. I also have NetBIOS and like Samba. So sometimes you can like remotely mount systems and there's some weird stuff going on. Wait, wait, you, you found Samba shares just open on the internet? It's public, completely open, public. You see like a lot of small businesses, they have like these like file servers or something and they're totally misconfigured. And you see like passports, social security numbers, everything. Like the information that you need to fax sometimes, whatever, they store that locally on a file server and sometimes it ends up on the internet. Do you think this is one of those things where just like within a small IT shop, people have this kind of sense that there is security through obscurity? Like, well, no one knows our IP address, so how could they get, you know, it's like, like, like having your number not listed in the phone book. I don't, I'm not even sure it goes that far. I don't think they even think about security. I don't, I don't think it's even on the radar. Uh, what they see is that I want to be able to access my stuff remotely. When I'm at home, I'm a small business owner, I want to be able to see everything that I, that I own anywhere in the world. So whatever IT needs to do to make that work, that's what I want. Yeah, and yeah no, convenience. Convenience is king. And that, actually, ironically, it's not just true for small business owners. It's even true for huge companies that run like, you know, Siemens, Schneider, like, you know, people who run power plants or sell software for power plants. Exact same business reasons. They want to, instead of sending out a tech guy to every location, they want to have the ability to have one tech guy sitting in the office manage, you know, 20 different water treatment facilities. So the, the same reasons why a small business owner has a file server, big companies that run power plants, you know, run web servers. And, and that's the latest new hotness with Shodan and the, the kind of stuff that you've been getting in the press lately is because uh, SCADA systems, tell me about those and, and tell me about, like, you know, as opposed to the small business owner, say, dams in France. Yeah, so SCADA is an abbreviation for Supervisory Control on Data Acquisition Systems. Really long, fancy abbreviation. What it actually means is all the power plants, traffic lights, heating and you know, uh, air conditioning systems, like everything that you see around you that you probably don't expect to actually be powered by a computer or have a web server on it at least. Turns out they've actually over the past decade slowly added web servers to them so businesses can remotely manage them. But they didn't think about security when they added web servers. And people in the security industry have been complaining for decades about the lack of security in these SCADA systems. And now, since they're becoming online, those vulnerabilities are actually becoming relevant. Because all of a sudden, you know, before you had to be physically there to actually plug in a vulnerability, whatever. But now, they're on the internet. And so people are very shocked and surprised by that. And that's why like big outlets like CNN and slowly have slowly started to pick up on. 
and also Congress. Let's you know, mind you, this is the critical infrastructure that our nation is so concerned about. With you know, there's been a couple of acts trying to go through Congress as far as you know, securing our nation's critical infrastructure. There've been some, you know, about. Uh, what was it, subsidizing like IT uh, um, penetration tests and things of that nature for these companies that are, well, critical to keeping, uh, you know, our water and our power and everything going that makes this nation, you know, work. Yeah, exactly. People are very frustrated that why are businesses putting these things online in the first place? Like, I mean, it makes no real sense. And the reason they do it is usability, right? Yeah. And so... Well, no it's costs. Exactly. Actually, yeah. Saving money. That's, that's what it really means. Instead of hiring 20 people, you hire a few people that can manage everything remotely. So that's why they want to create these policies, or some people are advocating for policies, so that Congress can create business incentives. So they, if you don't probably secure this, you know, either you're not going to get some tax incentives, or you're not going to like you get fined, or other regulatory you know things can come down upon you if you don't do these things properly. Yeah. It's like PCI and HIPAA will make its way to infrastructure. Yeah, funny you mentioned HIPAA because there, there is nothing like that. Okay, HIPAA protects patient privacy, right? But it doesn't protect the medical devices. Well, why, why should I be concerned about medical devices? Who would put a heart monitor on the internet? Right, who does anything ever like that? Yeah, no surprise. Yeah, obviously there are heart rate monitors. And what's really shocking is actually many of these devices, they run Telnet. Wait, tel Telnet? Like T-E-L-N-E-T, like, T -E -L -N -E -T, like yeah, port 23? Yeah, Telnet, the ancient service that most people consider to be dead decades ago, like just use SSH, I mean anything. It's an unencrypted service. You can see all traffic that goes through it. It's notoriously insecure, but it's really easy to use. And it's really easy to deploy if, say, I'm making a device, a medical device, where I've got a serial port and I need a nurse to be able to plug into it and get some data off. That's a different thing. That's a serial port. Yeah, but if you need to have it in a connected manner, then the analog to a serial connection for most people is Telnet. So people are surprised there are more Telnet servers on Shodan than on HTTPS. Than HTTPS. There are yes. more of the, the most insecure protocol. There's more of the most insecure than there is of, well, sadly, the most secure thing that's ubiquitous. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's completely shocking. People don't realize how common Telnet still is. And it's not dying out. It, it, many... Is it because of the, the life cycle of these SCADA devices? Because, like, say I'm in, in IT, I'm going to deploy a web server, and I expect to upgrade that every three years or so because, you know, it gets faster, cheaper, better, whatever have you. I'm not going to stay on IIS 5, right? But there, you don't have that same mindset in SCADA? Yeah, SCADA, you can't easily just, like, reformat a power plant. You can't just, you know, take it offline for a few days and be like, don't worry about it, you know, nobody will care. You, you, We're just going to do a cold boot here, people. Exactly. So the, the same things don't apply. You don't have the, the same infrastructure for patch management and all, like, you know, framework upgrades. Because these were deployed, like, 20 years ago or something. They, they old systems, and companies just buy a small module that's serial to TCP, IP, whatever, and then you can put them on the Internet. So what, what's some of the craziest stuff that you've seen on the Internet? So obviously there's a huge dam in France that was discovered like a year ago now. And even after a year, I haven't checked recently, but last I checked, it was still insecure. And this was a huge hydroelectric dam in France. And it had actually a history of people complaining that it flooded. And it wasn't, wasn't properly maintained. So this is the dam that was like on the internet. And the information was sent to the DHS. The DHS was like, holy shit. Like, this should not be online. So they called the French CERT, and the French CERT contacted, uh, it's a huge chain of things that has to happen. They eventually contacted the people who owned the dam, and the people who owned it were like, we don't care. How is this a problem? Like, nobody's going to find this. Why should we care? It's literally an issue of they don't realize the technology or understand the technology they're using. This is kind of like a reoccurring thing in InfoSec, is it doesn't matter how awesome your policy or your technology is when people just don't care. It, it, a lot of it comes down to societal issues. Yeah, it's the human factor, right? I mean, that's why social engineering has like picked off tremendously over the past like, few years and everything like that. The, the human factor is the limiting factor in many ways. So what does Shodan do for a penetration tester coming back to the service? Because, okay, so how did we get from, you know, where we are now, where you've got a database of millions and billions of, you know, insecure devices and telnet to, to you know, uh, scattered devices uh, through your website and the one day where you woke up and decided you were going to port scan the Internet? Um, so my initial idea with Shodan was not for it to be security related at all. I thought it would be used for market research. Like, you know, your, your Microsoft, it's like, well, who's using Apache, which data centers, and that kind of stuff. Or like, like Netcraft. Exactly. 
I actually modeled it bitly after Netcraft, but I thought, well, Netcraft only looks at web servers. I could look at FTP, SSH, I can look at all these other things and provide the same information. So like Cisco can be like, well, where are Juniper routers deployed? And just I thought it'd be used for market research, competitive analysis, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, turns out it's been used for something uh, very different and much more interesting. And, and so how do I get started using Shodan right now? So it's actually very easy to get started because a lot of people have already uh, saved searches, like example searches. If you go to Shodan website, people have saved searches to find you know, routers with default passwords, anonymous FTPs, power plants, wind farms. So even if you don't have any specific knowledge, you can get started by just browsing the search directory that's on Shodan. And otherwise, just type in whatever device you see around. You know, Type in pineapple, you might see something. Just, just type in whatever you find. You can type in like Futurama, a lot of banners. They have you know funny messages. Like yeah, slash slash dot, slash dot does that with their HTTP posts. Exactly. Is there's a Futurama quote in all of the HTTP headers? Yeah, exactly. And uh, like Reddit has uh, like a, a SQL injection in the header. So uh, there are all these things that are like hidden gems. WordPress has a job advertisement. So like if you see like you know X hacker, if you see this message, send an email to jobs at WordPress. So yeah, yeah, a lot of these companies have like unique banners. So it's kind of cool. And, and so how often do you keep it fresh? Because the internet's constantly a moving target. Uh, what, what do you do to keep the database um, updated? Yeah, so obviously the data is only as good as fresh as it is, you know, whatever. It has to be very new. So on average, I scan all the ports like, you know, once a month. So I would say on average once a month is when I, uh, you know. Wow, how many, how many nodes do you have uh, just scanning the internet all day? Not that many, like only a few dozen. And uh, yeah, only a few did, did you ever, when you were, this was a proof of concept before it became the, the commercial success that is Shodan, did, did you ever have any problems where like getting kicked off of ISPs for doing this on servers or virtual private hosts or whatever have you? Yeah, all the time. So when I first started Shodan, I ran it on like really, really cheap VPSs because you always pay a print for those things. And if they shut you down, then you lose your money. So, but over the years, since I've been mentioned in some news outlets, it's become easier. Like for example, you meant Lieberman. He mentioned Metasploit and Shodan in like in a New York Times op-ed, and if I can refer to those sort of things, the people like the VPS providers, and now I use dedicated servers mostly. That's why I have fewer than before. When I had VPSs, I had like 60 plus you know VPSs around the world because they kept on getting shut down due to abuse emails and stuff like that. But now everything's been more stable. I have some partners that I collaborate with, and they kind of understand what I do. So it's become easier. Do you find that certain devices respond differently depending on the GUIP you mentioned that you had, you know, you had like 60 VPSs around the world. Um, when you scan, are you able to filter by what is shown to me, say, if I'm coming out of Egypt versus if I'm coming out of the US? So you can filter by that, but obviously there are different results. And that's why I do have service in different countries. I have service in the US, Iceland, Russia, and some other countries as well. Because I want to be geographically diverse, because obviously you know, for example, a lot of people in the U.S., they might just categorically block China, like just categorically. And the same thing happens with other countries of the U.S., where just some things, you know, they might not be friendly to that. And So, yeah, you can't directly search for these things, but I try to include all the data on the Internet as best as possible. Cool. And so what's next for Shodan? Are you, uh, are you going IP6? Uh, not anytime soon. Uh, you're not going to, you're just going to scan a trillion, trillion, gajillion? Yeah, well, no problem. Well, to be fair, you know, people thought IPv4, you know, a decade ago was like, it's like 4 billion, oh my god, no, you're never going to be able to look at that, right? So, okay, I'm not going to pretend like IPv6 is the same magnitude, but there are tricks you can do, so you d I will probably not brute force, there are some DNS things that you can do, and, you know, you can translate from, you know, using DNS from IPv4 to IPv6 and stuff like that, but, yeah, I'm looking forward to adding IPv6, that'll be interesting. Sweet. So thanks so much for coming on, dude. It's really great to have you. And uh, everybody could, should go over to? Uh, ShodanHQ.com. ShodanHQ, thank you so much. Cheers. Working in IT means constantly jumping from one problem to the next, and you guys know how it is. Each issue needs to be solved fast, so every minute counts. Don't waste your time juggling multiple different tools and duplicating data entry. No, check this out. Use GoToAssist by Citrix. These guys are the leaders in remote support, and you'll have all of the tools you need in one integrated, easy-to-use platform so you can work faster and more efficiently. You see, GoToAssist includes three essential support tools that you can use to customize to your needs. You've got the GoToAssist service desk, 
It allows you to log and track incidents and uh, resolutions. There's the GoTo Assist monitoring, which I love because it proactively identifies issues so you can fix them before they become a major issue and your box is breathing down your neck. Why is the Exchange server down? Don't let that happen. Now, remote support is really what they're known for because these guys provide live and unattended support for any PC, Mac, or mobile device from anywhere to resolve the issues quickly. So get this, sign up for your special 30-day free trial today. Visit gotoassist.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use the promo code HACK5. That's gotoassist.com, promo code HAK5.